Welcome to Hockey Night in New York, where Islanders hockey always reigns supreme. Whether you were raised at the barn in Uniondale or born in the stable at Belmont, Hockey Night in New York is your home for all things Isles. Now, let's drop the puck and get this party started. Ladies and gentlemen, it is Hockey Night in New York. Welcome to the program, everyone. It is Monday, April 10th, 2023. Coming to us live from Floored Media in Rockville Center. Got a sad, depressing, unfortunate show coming up for you tonight. Wow. Well, come on. <laughs> At least portions of it. No, we have uh, we have some great guests coming on to join us. Yes, a therapeutic show. That's a good way to put it. We all probably need a little therapy after what just happened on the ice with the New York Islanders. But we are very, very pleased to have Andy Sutton join us, former New York Islander. And, of course, teammate here at Hockey Night New York, Stefan Ross, are going to call us from D.C. and tell us uh, all the gruesome details about what happened on the ice. With me tonight is Mr. Chris Bottom. My name is Sean Cuthbert. Welcome to the program. Chris, how are you? I'm doing fine. And appropriately <laughs> somber, Sean Cuthbert, to open the show today. I appreciate that. I respect that. We'll take this next hour, maybe hour in a little bit, to dissect what what yeah. happened yeah. uh but we'll try to have a little fun here i'll try to put it into perspective and also have uh, at times an optimistic tone i'm really happy about the two guests we have one live yes. at the rink what more can you would you ask of a podcast right right after the game and also an andy sutton somebody who's not connected affiliated in any way gives no f's whatsoever and i think he'll be able to bring a pretty good perspective as well no question about it so before we dive in just want to remind you all that we are very proud to be presented by blue line deli and bagels Located at 719 West Jericho Turnpike in Huntington, 217 Carlton Avenue in Isisop, and of course, UBS Arena Belmont. Also, a big thanks to Lost Farmer Brewing Company, located at 63A 2nd Street in Mineola, and a big thanks to Main Street Board Game Cafe, located at 307 Main Street in Huntington Village. More about them later. So, Chris, and everybody, everybody who's tuning into the show right now, we all know what just happened in Washington, D.C., and I don't think you could have had a worse start to the game. It's really, really hard to believe that <laughs> yeah. when you look at that opening, three-zip lead by the Washington uh -huh. Capitals, uh -huh. with their uh, lineup that was short a player and also players. short some you NHL players. players as well, yeah. uh, but short one player on the roster for cap reasons. It, it's really, you know... I think about, of course, there have been bad losses in the last couple of months sure. during this good stretch. Uh, 2 nothing at home to Buffalo stands out. Dropping a point to Columbus on the road stands right. out. A, an absolute stink bomb in Boston, a blowout, a, a, for the most part, a no-show. Mm -hmm. But all the good that was done since Bo Horvat arrived, mm -hmm. right. since uh, Matthew Barzell went out, was undone in a five minute stretch and if that's not sports if that's not hockey right. if that's not yes our new york islanders of since 1980 whatever mm -hmm. um you know it's really an incredible thing all those things said and we'll talk about it i'm sure as the show goes on this is not over by any stretch right because the biggest example reason for hope is just as the islanders crap the bed tonight mm -hmm. There, there are, there's no reason to just think that Pittsburgh will sail through their games. Fairly easy games. Very easy games on paper. I get it. Uh, Florida will have a tough game. So lots to talk about tonight, buddy. Plenty to talk about. And we might as well just start with, with what's fresh in our memories here. And, and what happened? Well, like, well in, from your perspective, what happened in that beginning? Well, you know, it's been a, an unfortunate trend and, and a topic on this show throughout the season since October is this team having a hard time getting up for the beginning of games? But, I mean, this is just the most extreme of cases here where a minute and three seconds in and you're down to nothing. And and truth be told, I didn't even have the game on Neither. to start the game. So I just started getting the alerts on my watch, right? So my watch, and I see Imagine one. That we're doing a podcast tonight, and we didn't feel that alarm. Maybe that maybe right. we weren't ready to start the well, game tonight. I mean, life got that in the way. I had all, some things it? I had to take I care it. of. But, I, I get. It. But anyway, the the first couple of first the first goal dings on my my watch. I'm like, all right, down one nothing. Mm -hmm. uh, Thirty seconds in. All right, fine. Plenty of game to go. Then the watch dings again, and I see the little two nothing Capitals. It's like. 
come on. That's got to be it. That's got to be like a NHL.com mistake. And I'm waiting for it to correct itself. And it doesn't. I'm like, you got to be kidding. Me. I swear, when I saw the second one, uh-huh. and there are some reporters, whether it's Ethan, Kevin, seem to be like really good, like they're a minute or two ahead of everyone else, including mm-hmm. the team or whatever. And, but my immediate thought, you talk about denial. This shows that, you know, how much this team remains in my heart after all these years. Mm. My immediate thought was, I wonder if it's going to go to replay and it's a high stick. <laughs> right. I didn't see it. Right. I had no, I had no idea, but yeah. that was like my thing. Like, oh, I wonder if it'll come yeah. off the board. That's how rational or irrational I was when I saw two Zephyr no, minutes. Chris, plus. same, but except I was thinking of like technical errors on the app side. Because yeah. I've seen yeah. that happen too, where you get like a phony goal show up That's in your right. notifications and then it comes back. And I was like, oh, it didn't, it didn't come back. And yeah. then I actually see the stat line with, you know, who scored and at what time. And I was like... A minute in, and these guys are already down two goals. I mean, talk about a bad start. But I want to ask you, so after the game, Zach Parisi, yeah, I'm a fan. I understand this. I think this thing about urgency. Mm -hmm. Kevin Kerr has asked him after tonight's game, he asked him probably about 22 minutes ago, give or take a minute, about uh, was there a sense of urgency. And Zach said, you know, you you just cannot convince me that we were not ready to play the game. Now, I know fans might not like that, although coming from somebody as well-respected as Zach it holds a lot more water, but I, I agree. Like, I don't know what that means, right? Like, were they not? Tra- it's execution. It's failure. Well, you had can... Adam Pellick, had a, of all people, had a, not a great start. Ilya Sorokin, of all people, did not have a great start. So, your thoughts? Well, you can break down these goals, and like, they weren't for a lack of effort. I mean, you might say a lack of mental well, <laughs> capacity, or get, but, yeah, getting it separate. but but that first goal, you know, you have um, Pellick has the puck in a dangerous area. He probably thinks he has a teammate behind him because he he makes a very dangerous pass, but he figures it's going off towards the boards and he's probably safe. But the problem is there's a Washington Capitals sitting and waiting right, waiting right there. Dylan Strom has the puck. He's on his own, puts the puck in, down one nothing. right? Second goal, face-off in deep. They lose the face-off, which is a rarity for the Islanders these days. And, you know, this was just a, a very, very poorly timed soft goal let in by Sorokin. I don't think he was screened on the play. I don't even think it deflected on the way in. It just, for whatever reason, it fooled him, and it just caught him, you know, in that, like, you know, that mid that mid uh, spot on the side there, and um, and it goes through. I think, yeah, he, he just tucked his glove a little too low. It went just over his glove. For whatever reason, he thought the puck was going a little bit on the lower end, ended up going higher. It goes in the net, and then just like that, they're down to nothing. Now, you know, I don't know how you can call that a lack of effort. I mean, you, they barely had a minute to try first, right? It was just two very unfortunate plays, and then you fast forward to the third goal, and, I mean, that just, you know, that just looked like... Um, God, I, you know, I, I think of these Islander games of, of years past, right, where, like, they're just, like, falling all over each other, you know, and, and this is what ends up happening, just where, you know, a bad play ends up being made where the puck ends up, you know, on Washington's stick, and then Pellick steps on, P- Pollock drops his stick, Pellick steps on the stick, he goes careening into the boards, and then you have another capital wide open in front of the net, and, you know, unfortunately, you know, Sorokin can't stop everything, especially every point-blank b- shot that comes his way, right? That one goes in, and they're down 3 nothing. so... A lack of effort for those goals is tough for me to say. I mean, you know, I'm not going to say so much bad luck. There was a little bit of bad luck, on, particularly on the stick situation. But, I mean, they made some mental errors and, and unfortunately paid dearly for them and they could just never recover. I guess you can question the effort, I guess, for the rest of the game. Mm-hmm. The fact that they weren't able to put any pucks in the net in the first or second period and they really didn't get, any, get anything going until the third, which was obviously way too late. But... Were they ready to play? Did they know the circumstances? Of course. It just did not go their way. If it if they wind up learning a, a painful lesson here and, and don't make the playoffs, I think how this should be looked back upon is you cannot let yourself get into this situation, right? So That's it. As, as, as well as they've played these last two months, as um, mm-hmm. they really deserve credit. I know that drives fans crazy when I right. say that and other people say it, but I'm also the first person to rail against that kind of thing mm-hmm. when it's not needed, uh, when it's not deserved and it's not earned. But they put themselves in a position where they could not have a bad period or a bad stretch. Right. Uh, and they did that, by the way, going back 
six months. That's that. Yes. That, that's the build up to this. The, um, so so there is that. And then what makes this hockey? And again, it's also why. Like I don't know, like Columbus against Pittsburgh, right? You know what what might happen in Columbus. Right. I don't know. You know Chicago, uh, Carolina, who playing now for something, especially uh, against mm-hmm. uh, against Florida, who is still not that impressive, right? But you know, Washing if Washington played. Ovi and Oshi and Mantha <laughs> and Van Riemsdyk. Right. You know, the Anders would probably win tonight. Like this is <laughs> this is what makes the know. NHL the NHL. The Anders yeah. for years have been on that side of the, the, these kind of wins at sure. times too. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it's another way, again, fortuitous that Andy Sutton's joining us because he's been on both sides of those in his NHL career as mm-hmm. a spoiler and right. sometimes getting in. But that's that's the thing is they – they were there was no room for a bad stretch, and they had it. And whether I don't know if Peter said anything to Team Laviolette to, to, to these guys on Washington, mm-hmm. but from the beginning they were loose. And the Islanders maybe they weren't tight, but they weren't loose, right? I said to my buddy this morning, I said, "This is the game I'm worried about." I said I wasn't worried about the Tampa game, wasn't worried about the Philly game. I said, "This is the one." I said, this is the one I'm concerned about. And for that very reason, because you just knew that the Caps were going to come out and put it all out there. And I just, I know we're going to go to break, but mm-hmm. I also, you know, when we talk about all the other things that, that you know, Preece said that we need help, you know, the Islanders also have to beat Montreal. Yeah. And, and I know you were right to finger this game is the one that concerned you, but Montreal hasn't played since a game on the weekend. Mm-hmm. And you talk about loose. And you talk about also tight with the the Islanders have to win that game for Thursday to to us for us to earn the scoreboard watching right right and uh, right. you know they got we're take, assuming they have to take care tomorrow. of their yeah they have to take care of their own business on Wednesday at UBS against Montreal yeah no without a doubt and and to just the point that you made really quickly before we go to break here is that you're absolutely right is that the Islanders put themselves into position well before tonight. You know what I mean? It, it comes down to so many squandered points, and I've, I've had the Arizona games pointed out to me multiple times, and, you know, you have the the Vancouver game. I think that was Horvat's first game, right? They had multi-two goal leads. They end up squandering both. They lose in regulation in that game. They don't even get a point out of that game. And I'm sure there's plenty more you can go down the calendar and be like, there's another one. There's another one. And that's, you know, unfortunately what this team has been all season is is, is they never found that consistency to be considered one of the at least top half of the league teams right where you know they were kind of safely somewhere in the playoff picture and we always said throughout the season we think they're gonna get and we think they're gonna get and we never we never said they're you know we never <laughs> made a guarantee but we always felt good about it mm-hmm. right and and you can go back probably through the library through the archives of these shows and and just us talking about how you know they they win a couple then they lose one or two they win a couple then they you know and they have that disastrous January but they just haven't been that consistent team and and it really you know all of that negativity all those bad games that they had reared their head tonight and like that's what everybody's thinking about now because I mean they could have just coasted into the playoffs I would and, say the, I would say the fans are welcome tonight we always call this questions brewing uh, I think it's okay for it to be brewing. for frustrations <laughs> brewing emotions brewing sure you could read like if people say things that are somewhat cogent right not not they're way uh, ahead of you not alcohol and <laughs> way ahead of you. I, I would i would welcome sure you ready. share like if somebody has something particularly insightful to say otherwise <laughs> i told you they suck all year you know uh i would say you know please feel free to share them all right folks well we're going to take a quick break because andy sutton former new york islander will be joining us looking forward to that so i want to thank you all for tuning into twitch.tv slash hockey night ny and of course your favorite podcast providers later on we will be right back I don't want to hear it. It's over. I can't believe they fell short again. Yeah, but they played so well. They made it to the semifinals two years in a row. The semifinals aren't the cup. God damn it, the heat was lightning. They'll get another shot at it next year. I don't even want to talk about it anymore, all right? They lost, okay? Let me just sit here and enjoy the one thing that makes me a little bit happy. This fresh, delicious, tasty, meaty, turkey-filled blue line combo. I eat three every day to help keep me strong. Hey, Donnie, can I have one of those? Coming right up. (laughs) 
talk about a blast from the Blue Line. Blue Line Deli and Bagels. Our goal is to make you a hero. Miss the days of mixtapes and arcades? Love the taste of a bold IPA or maybe an ice cold lager? There's a place where all of those magical things come together. Lost Farmer Brewing Company. At 63A E 2nd Street in the heart of Mineola, Lost Farmer combines a love of the 80s and a passion for quality beer to create brews that can only be described as gnarly, radical, and totally tubular. The retro vibe of the tasting bar will amp up your nostalgia while the blend of both local and exotic ingredients amp up your taste buds. Beer not your thing? Crack open a can of cider or a sip of Chardonnay on the extended patio. Order up from the snack menu? You can even bring your own. If you're more of a homebody, pick up a growler to go or order online at lostfarmerbrewing.com. And for all of Long Island's hockey fans, Lost Farmer created the delicious Stable Shaker American Lager to celebrate the newly built UBS Arena at Belmont Park. Whether you're at the stable for a hockey game, concert, or a comedy show, you can find Stable Shaker by can and draft around the arena. So raise a cup to the next cup with Lost Farmer Brewery, the future of Long Island craft beer. Thanks for giving some time to our sponsors. Ready to talk more aisles? The train rolls on right here on Hockey Night in New York. And welcome back, Chris Potter, with Sean Cuthbert. Really glad to bring on our first guest of the night. He's the CEO of Verbero. They're, they're really fantastic and and uh, just great, original, uh, innovative stick and, and hockey manufacturer company, apparel company too, equipment company, and uh, experienced NHL defender with the Islanders, Thrashers, a few other teams, 676 NHL games, and that's Andy Sutton. How are you, Andy? I'm doing well, Chris. Nice to see you. Same here, buddy. Really appreciate you doing this. I know you're a busy man, and uh, and your hours are a little bit different, so you're taking one for us. So I really thank you so uh, much, Andy. How, no problem. It's how's life? Pleasure. How's life with the family? How's life post playing career and at Verbero? I got to ask you with that, and then I'm going to ask you about the Islanders game tonight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, life life is good. Uh, definitely busy with work and stuff, and uh, and family. Just kind of navigating that course, but all in all, I can't complain. Things things are great here where uh you know the the business is growing and it's it's been a lot of fun to be back in hockey so you know it's uh you know pretty uh pretty simple just put one foot in front of the other and hope for a hope for a great day and and just stack them up uh, it's really great gotta get your player experience here as somebody who's been on both sides of these games right islanders had a game that meant everything tonight they play yeah. in washington Washington either sits for injury, for rest, for cap purposes, a uh, one less skater, no Ovi, no Ovechkin, Van Riebsdyk, et cetera. You've seen these games. You've played in these games. Is there an explanation for the Islanders falling down three zip just a few minutes in? Well, it, I don't know. It's, it's pretty simple to me. You know, I think when these games are on the line, you're obviously, you know, you're really hardwired to uh, to try to go the extra distance. So the game means everything to one team, and you know, and on the other side, the other team can play super loose, and they've got guys that aren't normally in the lineup, and and maybe they're fighting for a spot for next year. It's it's just a different it's just a different deal, and I think when that tension is is on and that tension is mounted, sometimes you can come out a little tight, and if the other team's loose and they've got nothing to lose, and they're just having fun playing the game. We, we know that, you know, when you're using your unconscious mind, you're able to process a lot more thoughts. And if you're overthinking things, it's very difficult to uh, to achieve at a high level. And and then you get a few bad breaks, you get on the wrong side of it and and it's too late. And, and you got you guys know, I mean, the it's it's once you get down three, three goals, it's it's pretty, pretty tough to come back in this league. The, the teams are, are really good defensively and. And like I said, they're the other side's playing for something too, you know, and, and uh, you know, on a lot of, on a lot of levels, it, it might even be easier for them to play for what they're playing for. That's the other part I wanted to ask you about tonight's game, Andy, is one thing for the Islanders to get down three zip, it, it happens, right? It's hockey. But I think a lot of observers, including myself, were surprised that it, it only in the final minutes, really the final minutes, did they get any sustained offense going? Is it just that much harder to come back from that deficit in this type of game with so much on the line? Is it possible uh, the game just gets harder? I think everybody's grabbing the sticks a little more tighter. What's that like? 
Well, and again, like on the Washington side and from what I saw tonight, you know, they seem to be be playing pretty loose and free. Um, as you said, they they rested some key guys and that gives opportunity to other people. And, and it, it looked like they were having a lot of fun too. I mean, there's there's the players that know they're going to be back next year and, the, the, you know, there didn't seem like there was a lot of stress on them. And then you get on your heels, you know, you're the Islanders, you get on your heels and then you're gripping it even harder because you know how important it is. And sometimes you just can't manufacture it. So, you know, sometimes it's not your, it's just not meant to be that night, you know, and um, you know, late pressure is fine, but you know, I think I heard you guys say before I got on the, these situations where it comes down to the wire like this, you look back on, all the games you wasted earlier in the year. And as much as we want to lament, you know, a couple of bad periods or, you know, a loss, a loss in tonight's game, it's, it's really, it's really not about that. If you're in this situation, you've really got to, you've really got to look back further and, and all the, all the things that, uh, that sort of escaped you. I actually, I lied. I have one more <laughs> to specifically as it relates to this game, because I'm thinking about you, the Islanders are on the road, but what a big hit or a fight have helped somewhere along the line to really get it going. Well, I don't know something guys, I, you know, that's the other thing I, I, I've seen a big change in that just in general, obviously not just the hitting and the fighting, but even, even just somebody to step up and just do something, do something out there. You know, it's like it, when it, when it's down to it and you, and you've got to have something, you've got to, you've got to figure out a way to manufacture it. And you're, you're probably right, Chris, you know, like you know, maybe something did need to happen, you know, maybe, maybe Marty needed to go out and, and, and run somebody over, who knows, run the goalie, take two minutes, like just change the, just change the course of the game. I mean, everything was on the line. So it's, it's, uh, I don't know it's a, it's a tough one because you want to stay out of the box at the same point in time, you know, you want to create some energy. So I don't know where the rub is. That's, that's why, uh, that's why coaches get the big bucks, I guess. <laughs> hey Andy, how's it going? Sean Cuthbert here. Really appreciate you coming hey, on with us tonight. Um, so look, the game's over, you know, we talked about it. You just mentioned it yourself. You know, you, you probably you have your fair share of tough losses throughout the year, but this is the one that's going to sting the most right now. They they lose control over their fate of the playoffs. They got to, you know, get themselves together for one more, win their game against Montreal on Wednesday, and hope for the best as far as the other results go. But when these players get into the locker room after a loss like tonight, and they know that they have to get out there and win that game on Wednesday, are there guys looking around, you know, waiting for a voice to speak up and say something after a game like that? Or, I mean, what's the locker room look like after the loss? Is it, is it quiet? Are they waiting for the coaches to step up and say something? Like, especially in your experience, how, how does that work, you know, for a fan kind of trying to look at uh, from the outside looking in here? Well, I mean, and I'm, I'm sure somebody said something, you know, at the same point in time. So, sometimes there's really not much you can say. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing that was a pretty, pretty quiet locker yeah. room. I mean, I think if you don't, if you don't know what that game meant, you're, you're missing the point. So, you know, and, and we're, you know, they're professional athletes. So they, they're paid, they're paid to do this. And, you know, the, the games that matter, uh, matter a lot. And, and if you don't get it done, um, as much as you can be rah, rah for the next game, this was a big one, especially with Florida stealing a point uh, against Toronto. It, it makes it, uh, makes it exceedingly more challenging for them. Um, so I, I don't know. I mean, it, you can, I guess you just hope for the best and you certainly want to rally back and, and get up for that last game, but the the fates might be sealed by then. You never you never know. So I, it's kind of you know you got one game at a time, and this this was it. This was this was the Stanley Cup final. I I always you know you see it often, especially with teams like you know. But you link back to the Kings just scraping in, you know, in eighth place, and they won the cup a couple times in that in that position. Those, those teams that that sneak in like that, they're playing playoff hockey for a month or two months before it gets started, and that's why that's a team that really nobody wants to play. And and um, you know, the cream rises to the top and that's the hardest championship trophy to win. And uh, for a reason, you know, it's a, it's a gauntlet and, and you've got to, you've got to be able to, to, to go the distance. No doubt about it. And then let's pivot a little bit to your time on the Island playing for the New York Islanders. Maybe you can just talk about your experience playing for the team and uh, with the fans and even just, uh, just playing on Long Island, how you, how you liked it here uh, while you were here. I loved playing on the Island. I, I really did. I had, I had a great time and, uh, you know, we were obviously still at, still at NASA and, and that had its, uh, that had its pros and cons, I guess we can put it that way. And Charms, we say. We, we had a great, we had a great group and, and, um, you know, we, uh, we, we had a great group. I mean, let's be honest. I mean, Billy Guerin, we had Dougie Waite, you know, we had, uh, you know, a lot of, a lot of great players that, that were leaders and, and, um, you know, we had every opportunity I think to win and, um, you know, we never, we never quite got it done while I was there, but, uh, at the same point in time, 
New York, the Islanders, the Islands, a great place to play. I mean, people love, people love hockey. Um, it's a, such a story franchise that always felt so special to me. I mean, all the, all the iconic legends were always around the games and stuff, which felt super cool. And, um, you know, every, everybody that works there was so, so professional. So it was, a, you know, start, start to finish for me. It was a, it was definitely a, a big highlight of my career. And I spent three years there and lived in garden city and got the bump into bump into New York city, you know, quite a bit. And it was a, it was a pretty, pretty special time for sure. That's awesome. And and Chris obviously mentioned earlier that you're now CEO of your own hockey company in Verbero. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about that, how that, uh, how that got started and uh, the experience kind of going from, you know, on the ice to now having your own hockey company. Well, how long do you guys have? This is, a, <laughs> this is an evolution, but uh, yeah, I, I retired from the game in 2014 and uh, prior to my retirement, I, I was actually developing some intellectual property in the protective space and working to license those uh, intellectual properties and, and, uh, Long story short, I ended up working as president of a multi-brand hockey company. Uh, while I was there, I was part of some acquisitions and other things. And right around the time COVID started, uh, um, I put that all the call and left that left that business and took the Verbero brand with me. So Verbero Verbero has been around since 2008. It paid into the NHL for three seasons, um, and and it had you know had some some good aspects to the brand. But I really wanted to to you know give it a jump start. I really needed it. It was dying on the vine. Um, so our focus as much as we're an equipment manufacturer is really on everything custom. Uh, we, we have proprietary software, both on the team store side and, uh, really the order processing side. So sort of like picture like DoorDash for custom goods. Um, we've really put that at the forefront of things. And, um, you know, and then in addition with that, we've got the lightest stick on the market. We've got a, you know, 3d printed helmet, the only full custom goalie system. Um, we're, we're turning everything faster than everybody else. And at, at more, more cost effective pricing, I tell everybody this all the time. Like we have the lightest stick on the market. A lot of people have never heard of it and might not trust it. Uh, but that, that doesn't mean it's not better. It's just, you know, this is the industry we, we live in and, and everybody's so routed to the, to the status quo and the incumbents. But at the same point in time, we sell that stick all the time at 249. So, I mean, now they're, you know, they're upwards of 380 or four or $400 for the top tier equivalent from the other brands. And so when you see us at 249 and that sort of embodies what I want the brand to be is, is really access to top quality product without, without compromise. Um, and we want to be approachable. There's, there's no reason why I, I tell, as I give this example all the time, like the difference between a $200 skate at retail and a $1,200 skate at retail is about $50 at manufacturing costs. So why should the customer have to pay a thousand dollars for something that costs the brand $50? So we, we kind of apply a lot of that, um, you know, to everything we do and then really just try to try to make things a lot more, a lot more approachable, um, accessible, and really more than anything, uh, just a better overall experience. Yes. And, and we're, we're, we're really growing quickly in this space. I think because we're putting this focus on, uh, on, on custom and all aspects of custom. That yes. sounds fantastic. I say he's a disturber on the ice and now he's uh, <laughs> disturbing the, the business. <laughs> and I, I play for a couple of I don't, I don't know another way about myself, this. So I might have to check it out. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's like, you got a couple of companies. That, it's hard to believe that after all these years, and maybe you might be inspired if you see the uh, air movie, because Nike was third uh, when they started uh, with the air Jordans. But it is amazing that everybody's just like, Oh, we, you know, for some reason we got to use this particular brand or not. And you guys are in here. I've seen your videos and, and uh, the, ones that the other guy does and they're they're really really interesting so congratulations on all that thanks yeah it's it you know it's great we wake up every day and 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 tack, tackle the uh it's i don't even say the giants because the the other brands are so rooted in their in their conventions that it's, it's actually easy for us we stay nimble we go fast we go hard and, and we we attack them head on because we truthfully we have a better program you know they're they don't really focus on the aspects that we do they've given up attachment to grassroots hockey and that's that's where we spend all of our time and then we're really the only company that offers head head to toe um we're the only company that offers the you know the custom options that we offer like we give up the cuff space on gloves i could care less about plastering verbero all of the gloves i want teams to be able to put their team name on the cuff and you know that's another that's another example of of just how we want to be a great a great partner for our for our teams and associations and great work with all the women's players too. I was in the NWHL for five years as a comms person and love Blake Bolden and a lot of the players that I, I know you've worked with. So great job there. Back to your time with the Islanders. When you were with that group with Garen and Wade and everybody you'd mentioned there, Wit was around and Comrie was there, Fedotenko and on and on. Yeah. And you and you not able to put it together. I think it was Teddy's second year, might have been your first year, Teddy Nolan. How do you keep and I know I would imagine that 
you don't know, I was there for your first year as well. Um, it's not easy keeping it together, meaning keeping the focus, keeping the harmony. Can you discuss that a little bit about maybe either what you remember from your time with the Islanders or any other team when you're going through the long season and you're just not able to get it going? It's a, it's a grind. I mean, as, as you guys know, it's a long season. And when you're, when you're missing, you know, and, and sometimes you don't even know what it is you're missing, you know, it's, it's, you can't blame it on the coaches. You can't blame it on the management. You can't necessarily blame it on the players, especially when you've got, you know, top quality players. It just, it all has to work in unison. And um, when it doesn't, it doesn't, it's like when it's right, it's right. When it's wrong, it's wrong. And not for lack of trying, like I, I, nobody was going out there and not trying their best it's like you, you you can try your hardest and everyone can try their hardest, but it has to be cohesive. And, and, and that sort of, you know, comes with, with um, you know, buying, buying into an approach that, that, uh, that works and, and that, that sort of repeats night in, night out. You know, you think about the great teams and they kind of roll like waves, you know, and they've certainly got some great players, but, you know, it's just, they just, and it's a, it's attrition over the course of the season. And once you get into playoffs, that's, that's even, even further uh, exemplified in a seven game series. I mean, I, I can remember when I got traded to Ottawa at the deadline, my last year uh, with the Islanders and we played Pittsburgh in the first round. And this is in the, in the height of Crosby Malkin. And, and uh, you know, they had, they had Kunitz and, and uh, you know, Matt cook, and they had just a, just a, just a team of role players and great players and, and they were coached in such a way that I just remember, I just remember at the end of the game, like just being sore everywhere and realizing that literally every time I touched the puck, somebody hammered me, you know, and I remember thinking, holy shit, like this is going to be a long, this is going to be a long series, you know, if, if we can even make it through. And, and it was just like that. They just came at you like one wave after the next and just had no, no breathing room. So it's very clear to see uh, at a certain, at a certain point, the, the great teams, how, how much greater they, they truly are. And it's something, it's some kind of special sauce. They've got something intangible, something Something unspoken, you know. It was amazing to watch you lay your big hits, and then other teams. Like one guy knew he he did, he couldn't bother with you because you would just like <laughs> throw him down with one hand. But like four, the whole other team would come after you. Now there's this epidemic in the NHL where every time somebody lays a clean hit, he's yeah. being asked to fight. Yeah. So what's your reaction to that? Well, and it, it wasn't too dissimilar in, in my era, you know, um, but it was typically like a tough guy that would, would come. Right. And and I would either like, you know, I'd either take that on or be like, look, you play four minutes. I'm not fighting, I'm not fighting you. <laughs> um, you know, but it wasn't like every guy trying to grab you, you know, and, and nail you. But then going back to it, like I remember when I started out in San Jose and Daryl Sutter's thing was like one guy's one guy in all guys are in. Right. So he was, he was like, you know, beat them with this mob mentality. They want to mess around. Like, well, you, I want you guys all in there. Um, and, and so I, I don't know. I, I, I think the clean, I think the clean hit has been uh, almost pushed right out of the game. And this is another mm -hmm. reason why it's going to get pushed out. And if we don't have that, like, you know, I, I just, I just don't know what you can do. Like I, that's a skill just as much as it is, as it is to, to toe drag somebody and, and score a game winner, you know, to, to be able to hit somebody that way and open, especially in open ice and at a pivotal time of the game. And I mean, that can change the course of a game just as, just as much as a, as a goal can. So I, I don't, I don't know the answer to it. I, I certainly think if, a, if there's a, if there's a clean hit made and somebody starts a fight, like you should definitely be shorthanded at a minimum, maybe you even get an extra 10 minute misconduct or something. Cause I think that has to be discouraged. You know, if I nail somebody and, and somebody wants to fight and it's, and it's, you know, and it's the kind of thing where we, I get to agree to it and we drop the gloves and it's fair and it's square. That's one thing, but it's usually like somebody trying to jump somebody or it just, it just doesn't really set off on the right foot. And it sets, a, it sets kind of a terrible example for the, for the youth. And then also I think it just kind of erodes the fabric of the game. Cause I mean, we have to have that in the game of hockey, in my opinion. Yeah. Andy, you know, that's the problem that I have with that is that it, it almost forces a player to think twice now about laying a good hit because they actually have to think about sitting for five minutes afterwards because if they get jumped, I mean, you're not going to not defend yourself, right? I mean, if somebody's starting to throw hammers at you, you're going to have to throw back, right? And then, and then of course, you're going to get called for the fighting major because, you know, the, the cameras will show you were actually fighting. So I just, I don't know what the answer is, but it just doesn't seem fair to these guys who are laying down, you know, good, clean hits and then they're getting jumped for it, you know? 
Well, and especially go even further. I mean, if you're willing to even step up and do that with the hypersensitivity and the suspensions around it, I mean, the last thing you should have to do is also fight somebody. I mean, if it's a, if it's a penalty or you're like, you know, you hit somebody from behind or something like I can see it or it's dirty, you know, I can see it, but you're, I mean, you're going to get suspended for that. Those ramifications are already put in place. So if you're the kind of player that's willing to step up and deal with the repercussions of, of mm -hmm. potentially, you know, catching somebody too high or somebody deems it's too high uh, and you're willing to, you're willing to tote that line and that's your job. I mean, I don't think you should also have to necessarily fight on top of it. You know, it's just, and, and, and you can look, you can turn it down certainly or, or whatever needs to happen, but it just, it just doesn't seem like that's the way it's going. And I mean, I'm seeing all kinds of guys fighting that have never, that, have, that aren't fighters and it just doesn't, it just doesn't even look good on the game. I mean, these guys are getting like just killed and don't even know what they're doing. You know, it just, it doesn't, it doesn't make any sense, you know, why we can't just let that be part of the game. Andy, my last question for you is about hope. I'm not going to ask you to say that these teams are going to win, <laughs> but I'd like you, again, putting your hat on as a player on both sides of the equation, going back to some of the things you said earlier. Here's the deal. Islanders play Montreal at home on Wednesday, a game, again, they should win. They, but they have to take care of their own business, and if they don't, then that's their problem, right? But Pittsburgh plays tomorrow night, Tuesday, at home against – Chicago and then on the road Thursday in Columbus what is the case for Columbus and or Chicago winning those games well again it's like some these teams are and I was on a lot of these teams I I unfortunately didn't play in the playoffs as much as I would have liked and I was on a lot of expansion teams and typically you know especially you look at you know Chicago and Columbus have been out of the playoffs for a really long time this is a this is a time when two things can happen, right? Obviously, or maybe more than two things. You know, top players can get traded. You can you can start to you know sit sit guys, rest guys, whatever is going to happen. You're test you're testing new players. Well, these guys come in and they're 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 full of fire, right? And and it's almost like again, it's like a nothing to lose scenario. And there's there's just there's just uh, there's just not that much disparity either. This the quality of a player and the skill level across the board has gotten super high, and we've seen that young player young players are dynamic and they're ready to play in the NHL. So, you know, I, I don't think there's an there's a there's a guaranteed win anywhere to be found, uh, almost in any sports league anymore. And uh, and and this will be the same thing. So, I mean, the Islanders are going to have to be buttoned up, and and they're going to have to they're going to have to pray to the, to the hockey gods that, uh, that things go their direction. Otherwise I think it's curtains. Yeah. I think there's going to be a, a lot of prayers said over the last of the, over the next couple of nights on long Island, but uh, Andy, awesome, awesome stuff. Really appreciate your time. Thanks so much for joining us tonight. Yeah. It's my pleasure guys. Take care. Thanks Andy. Too. Thanks a lot. Hey, you're talking about a role model undrafted Michigan tech. We're seeing all these guys signing as free agents. Now, yeah. Right? Yeah. Coming out of this is a guy who came out of college, signed uh, with Atlanta, went on to play 676 games in this league. If we had a little more time, that was the one I wanted to sneak ah. in. Just ask him about what it was like playing in Atlanta. Our I think he was part freaking of the... out so much about the loss tonight. That, like, it was, like, Why you know, not switch it up? <laughs> exactly. But I think he was part of their first uh, playoff berth, too. Yeah. Yes, he you was. Know? Yeah, and now they're gone. They don't yeah. exist anymore. Yeah, but great stuff from Andy. So, uh, Chris, before we break for Stefan, why don't you tell us a little bit about Main Street Board Game Cafe? I will do that. Main Street Board Game Cafe in Huntington Village. <laughs> I was me putting my glasses yeah. on for those listening at home. On Long Island's North Shore, <laughs> games for sale and for open play. Food and drink, beer and wine, fun and friends. Bring the magic of phones down, eyes up, tabletop board games to your family. Our staff will help you find the right game for you from old favorites to the hottest new releases. We have everything from strategic to easy party games. Get off your screens and unplug your game for a night your family will remember. Looking for meetups to join our Magic the Gathering Dungeons and Dragons or Game Night Live communities are welcoming for all. They're located at 307 Main Street in Huntington Village. Go to MainSTBoardGameCafe.com for more information. Main Street Board Game Cafe. Find your crowd. Unplug your game. Unplug your game. So, folks, thanks for hanging out with us here at twitch.tv slash hockey night. And why we're going to take one more break. When we come back, Hockey Night New York, co-host and reporter for the Hockey News, Stefan Rosner will be joining us. We'll be right back. I don't want to hear it. It's over. I can't believe they fell short again. Yeah, but they played so well. They made it to the semifinals two years in a row. 
The semifinals aren't the cup. God damn it, I hate those lightning. They'll get another shot at it next year. I don't even want to talk about it anymore, all right? They lost, okay? Let me just sit here and enjoy the one thing that makes me a little bit happy. This fresh, delicious, tasty, meaty, turkey-filled blue line combo. I eat three every day to help keep me strong. Hey, Donnie, can I have one of those? Coming right up. Talk about a blast from the Blue Line. Blue Line Deli and Bagels. Our goal is to make you a hero. Miss the days of mixtapes and arcades? Love the taste of a bold IPA or maybe an ice cold lager? There's a place where all of those magical things come together. Lost Farmer Brewing Company. At 63A East 2nd Street in the heart of Mineola, Lost Farmer combines a love of the 80s and a passion for quality beer to create brews that can only be described as gnarly, radical, and totally tubular. The retro vibe of the tasting bar will amp up your nostalgia while the blend of both local and exotic ingredients amp up your taste buds. Beer not your thing? Crack open a can of cider or a sip of Chardonnay on the extended patio. Order up from the snack menu, you can even bring your own. If you're more of a homebody, pick up a growler to go or order online at lostfarmerbrewing.com. And for all of Long Island's hockey fans, Lost Farmer created the delicious Stable Shaker American Lager to celebrate the newly built UBS Arena at Belmont Park. Whether you're at the stable for a hockey game, concert, or a comedy show, you can find Stable Shaker by can and draft around the arena. So raise a cup to the next cup with Lost Farmer Brewery, the future of Long Island craft beer. there welcome back we missed you too now kick up your feet and settle back in to hockey night in new york that's right folks kick up your feet because we're we're back for the the remainder of our therapy session here at hockey night in new york and joining us right now hockey night new york co-host and islanders beat reporter for the hockey news mr stefan rosner on the phone with us from dc stefan how's it over down there in dc buddy well, uh, first, I wish you guys could see me. My, I look pretty cute in my suit right now. But uh, yeah, no, wow. it's um, okay. It's, it's not. Let's uh, ask him. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yep. <laughs> but uh, it's um, yeah. The room tonight was probably as quiet as mm. shot. The, fa- the faces of the players was shocked. Now they'll tell you, and you can tell they didn't think it would be a cakewalk against a depleted Capitals team. But mm-hmm. they were not expecting that. And that opening mid in three seconds. Might have been one of their, you know, worst opening minute and three seconds of the season, especially with how much was on the line. But, I mean, Zach Parise said it best. You know, you still have a whole you have 59 minutes, 58 minutes left right. to salvage something there, and they just didn't. Right. I, I guess that's the focus now, right? Like, you know, why weren't they able to chip away at this team, this depleted team? They knew what was on the line. Now, also, Zach Parise said, we talked about it a little while before, that, you know, don't talk to me about effort in the sense, you know, he, he mm-hmm. thought they, they put it out there. They, they played a hard game. So what did you see in the building there? Why couldn't this team chip away at this game and, and fight back? And, and I mean, until it was really just too little too late when they started putting pucks on net in the third. First off, I just to say, we all respect Zach Parise. He's a nothing but a leader in that room. But, you know, what he said, you know, intensity, he said that's not something really to be questioning. Brock Nelson was asked the same question about was there enough intensity early. He said, Probably not. When Lambert was asked the same question, he said probably not. So, again, clearly the intensity wasn't where it should have been at puck up. And throughout the game, uh, the Capitals did a solid job slowing the game down, but the Islanders did turn the puck over, botching three on one, not getting to the slot, missing chance. I think Tazo had three or four high danger chances to score. Engvall hits the post. And this is a guy, Darcy Kemper, isn't the best scoring league. He's not as bad as the, you know, people might think. Um, his numbers were. were a low, below average, but they didn't test him. A lot of shots, floaters from Dobson to the point. The power play had one shot on, on three chances. So the biggest thing I think was not scoring first or early. If the Islanders get a goal before the end of that first period, I kind of think they win. I think it was once they broke through, like they did, you know, it's happened before with this Islanders team. They go the first period where they're not getting a lot of chances, score a goal, they score a couple. I think that's what they needed, and no one stepped up and put the puck in that. Again, they had, Mike the Islanders didn't have the chance. So, I mean, the effort got better as the game went on. Sorokin 
gave them every chance to make something of this game. This is why Lambert said he kept them in, because he knew they'd need big saves they were going to salvage anything. And unfortunately, Sorokin was the only one that really bounced back. Yeah, so to your point, they weren't able to get it together during the during the game here, and they weren't able to chip away back. And, and like you said, the, the locker room was somber. They, they no longer have control of their destiny. So, I mean... Did they even did they even mention Wednesday night? Are they looking forward to that? Now are they are they looking towards that? I mean, do you, do they sound like they're even in the right mindset at this point to bounce back and win a game? They obviously have to, and then hope and pray that that they get the right results from from here and out from some other teams. That is exactly what Zach Krieger said. He was asked, "All you have to do is win Wednesday and and wait." I mean, that's all. Lamb, that's what Lambert said as well. I think I think after tonight, they have no choice. If they don't, if they come out flat Wednesday. One, they don't deserve to make the playoffs. I mean, you have to, you know, you have to put some effort in there if you if you want to find a way to get in. But I think this definitely was a deflating loss. I wouldn't really want to be on that plane ride going home. It's probably going to be dead silent, and, and they were pissed. I mean, Kazikas, I've never seen Kazikas more angry to mm-hmm. the point where maybe a tear or two was going to come down. If you know the wrong question, like he, he, that whole group was, again. It seemed like they were shell shocked. Um, now they need help, like you said. Now, it's not going to be easy. The, the Penguins play two teams that are fighting for the top pick in the NHL draft. Right. Um, the Panthers play Carolina Hurricanes team where, you know, they might be fighting for home life, but they've dropped, I don't know, four or five in a row right now. It's been tough. They lost again tonight. So, the Islanders do need help, but at the same time, at this point, they shouldn't have had to need as much help. They should have handled the Capitals tonight, and we'll see. But if they don't make the playoffs now, you can't really look at it and say, well, you know, because they didn't get help. They, they kind of did this to themselves here. Now they just, again, they have to win. If they win against Montreal on Wednesday, it doesn't mean they guarantee themselves the spot. But obviously, if they don't win, then it's over. Essentially, unless the Penguins, you know, really drop the ball. Right. Stefan, take us a little more. This might be inside baseball, but take us a little further inside the locker room. I'm curious as to how things play out on a night like tonight or really any any game during the season. So the locker rooms are open. I saw that. I know for sure that uh, Zach spoke. I know that Anders Lee spoke. Uh, you mentioned that Brock Nelson spoke. But when you go in, is everybody around and available? Or do you and Kevin and Andrew like uh, and, and uh, Mr. Sears uh, ask for for certain players to make sure they're available. I guess I'm I'm looking for, I know this isn't a, a team with accountability, but I'm just trying to get a sense of what that was like in the locker room after the game. Yeah, so usually you walk into the locker room and most players are there, especially at the start of the season. You had everyone in the room, people sat at their locker. If you needed someone that wasn't there, you could ask. Um, after bad losses, a couple of guys are in there. But again, if you ask Timber, uh, PR, they'll bring him out there tonight. You had when he walked in, you had Lee, Parise, Palmieri, Fazigas, but there's guys, if they get undressed and they're ready to leave and no one's talking to them, they're out the door and you're not getting them back. Um, but again, you have the, the important guys at your captain's there, the owner's captain's there, and he needs to talk. Parise's always at his locker regardless. Brock Nelson did come back out to talk to us. But yeah, it's, uh, again, tonight was just, you expected it. You expected to go into the locker room and uh, you were expecting little responses. You were, sorry, there's something the car coming through, but um, you're expecting, you're not expecting much and you don't want to ask those softball questions because you're not, again, you're not going to get a response. They're not going to make a talk to you. And again, understandable um, after lean talk, kind of like wanting to give him a hug. You know, like, I mean, as much as he's the coach and it's on him to get his players prepared, I mean, I mean you need your players to respond. You need your players right. to react. I thought maybe lean, you know, lean uses time out early. I don't know you should have pulled through and I, I certainly I think I would have if you do trust Varlamov to make those saves that was that was something interesting with the quote that he left through in there because he needs to open after make those big time saves to stop him now I'm not saying he was throwing Varlamov into the bus but it did kind of hint that they didn't trust Varlamov to go in and bail him out yes um, go ahead sorry go, go that's ahead, how sorry. I that's, a, that's how I viewed that again we know Sorokin's level we know Sorokin is a more um, I don't know if he's talented than Varlamov but he makes those Draw drop and see just due to flexibility, but it's flexibility that Varlama doesn't have to extend. But again, you know, Lane, there's not many much you can say after a loss like that. They didn't show up early and they paid the price. Yeah, and and speaking of the goaltending, just uh, my last one before we let you go here, bud. You know, look, obviously he was hung out to dry on some some awkward plays here. But what did you what did you think of Sorokin's game tonight? You being the goaltender that you are, I mean, did, I mean, especially that second one. Did it look like it hit anything on the way in, or did that just beat him clean? 
Yeah, that second one beat him. That's one he's definitely has to have. I'm not too, I'm not a big fan of the first one he allowed either. That's a short side shot. Again, a break down in front. Wasn't completely in the slot. That was some distance there. And Sorokin, again, the thing with Sorokin is he's made those. You know, there's a higher level of expectation with him to make saves, even if they're difficult, because he's done them. I mean, he doesn't do that. But I thought for sure the second one was a softy. First one, again, I think that's one Sorokin should have. Does the average netminder make that save? I'm not sure. And the third goal, of course, that's just a major breakdown in front of me. You know, there's not really much Sorokin can do that close. And, I, and credit to Sorokin because he doesn't bounce back and snap out of it. Looking at five, six, maybe even seven goals, and at that point you pull them. Um, so credit to him for giving them a chance. No, that's a good point. He definitely still had to make some big saves even after uh, a couple of those rough ones. Well, listen, Stefan, we got to keep uh, keep the go sh- show going here before we have to wrap up. But I uh, really appreciate you calling in from DC, and uh, hopefully we have some better news to talk about after Wednesday and Thursday. Sounds good. Talk to you guys later. Thanks right, a lot, bud, Stefan. Great stuff. All right, that was the great Stefan Rosner of Hockey Night New York and the Hockey News. So there you have it. Lane, so- and I should just add, Lane Lambert, after the game, I watched uh, the, the two-minute clip that the team posted. He was he was Lane-like. You know, he, he, <laughs> did, he didn't try to pretend to be anything that he wasn't. He did say it was tough to explain uh, the beginning, which is him just being honest, right? Like, I, you know, I'm not here, writers, I don't have the magic words that maybe – some other coaches who are more eloquent or willing to do that. He talked about, you know, yes, some bad bounces, but some poor plays. Uh, so, you know, it was it was kind of the down-the-road stuff you would expect from Lane. There was nothing fiery or nothing uh, revelatory about it. Yeah, I mean, you got to figure from Lane on down, everybody is just deflated after something like that. Sure. I mean, that's that's it's tough to get in front of a microphone after a loss like that with everything on the line and you know nobody wants to be in his shoes for for that sort of thing but I mean look now it's just it's just you know crush Montreal I mean please crush Montreal and then just cross your fingers at least get the lead early so you yeah have to sweat it out right? listen I mean maybe they get a little help tomorrow night I'm not expecting it but maybe they get a little bit of luck there and and then all of a sudden Wednesday looks a little more promising because because at this point. It's kind of it. Florida's now their their biggest enemy it's, right now, and reason biggest reason for hope. Right, exactly. Right, because if if you're just looking at these remaining games, I mean, you, you're gonna expect Pittsburgh to beat Chicago and Columbus. And shame on them if they don't. Right. I guess crazier things have happened, but that's probably gonna happen. So now with Carolina losing to Ottawa tonight, it looks like their game against. Florida is going to mean something, whether that's winning the division or maybe even just keeping home ice because, you know, there's that whole dynamic with the, the Devils and even possibly the Rangers still. So the, the the Hurricanes have something to play for. So it could definitely come down to the to the Panthers having to beat the Canes and the Islanders having to beat the, the Habs. And if the Islanders take care of business and if Carolina shows up that night, you might get in. You know, but I think you, you, you can't really expect Pittsburgh to be the, the team to go down now. So, you know, you kind of just have to hope for the, the Hurricanes to show up and win that game. And, and if the Islanders take care of business on Wednesday, then we're then we're talking about playoff hockey. And hopefully we are. What does one do on a night like tonight when it's time to pick the hero of the week? Why don't we go right into that, Ed? Press that button. Well, that sounded like you gave the uh, the whole. What's I thought we were going into what's on tap. We right there. You know, well look, you know? we I mean, listen. That, that, that was just like don't. that sounded like no, a we, we don't. Off oh, the but, cuff, but the tr- what's listen, on tap. Listen, segment. I we it was know beautiful. what's on tap. Here's what's on tap. Right, you don't even <laughs> gotta you don't even gotta play the song. What's on tap? One more game. They play the yeah. Montreal Canadiens on Wednesday, and then we're all going by the altar. Yeah, <laughs> lighting candles. Well, let's check out those heroes. Let's check out. So, ladies and gentlemen, when you hear this song, that means it's time for the Hero of the Week, brought to you by the Blue Line Deli Bagels Half Price Hero, which this week is the Poke Check, featuring roast beef, turkey, ham, Swiss and American, lettuce and tomato, and mayo on a hero. Stop on in to the Blue Line Deli Bagels Huntington location. I mentioned Hockey Night New York for half off the Poke Check. So, Chris Botta, I believe you went a little off the board for uh, Hero of the Week. As I do. Every other time, yes, probably. Indeed. Yeah. Uh, my <laughs> choice was made with about ten minutes left in tonight's game, and there was an amazing moment. So my hero is Butch Gordon. Now, obviously, he's a hero for a lot of reasons, including uh, being the guy who brought, helped bring okay. this, this team for Stanley Cups, and a terrific broadcaster, and a fun and unique broadcaster, and a heck of a guy, a a guy's guy, as they used to say back in the day, right? Um, love this person. 
But with 10 minutes left in the game, perhaps out of frustration, perhaps maybe being a little superstitious and going after it, uh, Butch uttered the term, I don't think the Islanders are going to score a goal tonight. He did say that. And yeah. then he kind of like, you know, gave a little praise to uh, Darcy Camper. And, but mm-hmm. uh, the shots just kept on going into the middle of his chest. And uh, I, I love the comment because it's honest. Mm-hmm. It's, it's everything, right? Like in this, in this big moment with just this crap tacular of a game <laughs> in the biggest spot for yeah. this franchise. And he's seen both sides of it as well as a coach, as a broadcaster, as an alum, as a, as, and as a player, obviously saw the highest of highs mm-hmm. and he's just watching this game. And as a former player, he's just thinking, you know, we might be here all night and they will never score. What's the point? Uh, of course they did later on. Right. And, uh, but anyway, I just, I, I love him for that comment. Mm-hmm. Uh, he was just kind of showing his heart his frustration and also, you know, his analysis. And yes, they did score. It wasn't even too little, too late. It, it wasn't even. It just wasn't enough, right? They, if right. they, could, if they just had gotten to three two, then again, the Islanders have been on that side of it too. The sticks are on Washington side. Those young guys, those no name guys, mm-hmm. they get a little more nervous. Everybody gets tighter, but they didn't. They just couldn't get there. And and, and I, I thought it was early to pull the goalie. I get it. It, it. That sounds like, you mm-hmm. know, second guessing. No, I think that's a great little nugget to raise because I, I, my ears perked up when he ah. said that too. And I was like, you know what, Butch? I don't disagree with you yeah. because that's how the game was going. It, like, where was that desperation that they showed at the end of the game? It just didn't seem apparent. Now, you can, you can, you can kind of, you know, separate desperation and, and effort, right? You know, Zach Parise and the Isles think that they had the effort, but. Desperation is a different thing, right? Desperation is is more just literally just throwing your body at every play, every every loose puck, you know, basically just you know throwing it all out there to you may, maybe even make a, a silly play you wouldn't normally make just to try to you know get a puck on net, get a puck you know towards the net, right? And they just didn't have that. It just for the Islanders, it almost just looked like a mid season game for them, you know, and it didn't look like it had any weight to it until the end, you know, when they pulled the goalie, and then all of a sudden they're getting some chances and shots, and and there was a there was a chance that Pajot had later on into the game, and I, and I commented on it on Twitter, because he has the puck in the slot, and he just winds up for a slapper, and he puts it right into Kemper's chest. And I said, if the game wasn't going the way it was going, that he wouldn't have even done that. You know, He probably would have either tried to make a move or at least put a, you know, tuck a shot under the bar or something like because that. Because the hockey know? mentality is, let's just get a shot on that. It just, point, yeah, it, it, it just seemed that, like... And that it, with the way that they were tightening their sticks and uh, you know holding their sticks tighter, and and he had a chance earlier in the game that didn't go their way. I know they hit a couple of posts too, and and I think it was just kind of like a, almost like a, a frustration sort of play. Yeah, we'll look know? at this game, or perhaps if they don't make the playoffs uh, from every way, and we'll think of the first period, we'll think of the third period, and the forgotten period will be the second. And I, I don't remember really anything about it, you know, like <laughs> I don't, and that's a problem. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. And uh, just to wrap up the segment, I'll give my hero. I went a little more traditional. Brock Nelson in the in the wins that seem so far in the past now, but he had two goals, two assists in the two wins. Obviously, some some big wins against Tampa and Philadelphia that got them to this point. Uh, he's obviously been the team leader here in in a lot of ways, and not just not just the point leader, not just the the goals leader, but um, he's really stepped up for this team, especially with Matt Barzell being out. And he hits a career high seventy three points. He he might have gotten one or two tonight if if he if he factored in those goals, I honestly didn't see the stat lines yet. But I know going into tonight, he had 73. It's a career high. And he's been he's been great for this team. And uh, hats off to him. And, and hopefully, uh, you know, the effort that he's put in this season isn't in vain. And, and he ends up playing a couple extra games at the end of the year. Speaking of what's on tap, uh, just to come back to it, just to give that a little <laughs> okay. love. Are, sure. are you going Wednesday? I guess it's it's going to be a really unique atmosphere. Yeah, I'll be there. And hopefully it's not the last one. Yeah, yeah I will be there. So, uh why don't we go right in to Questions Brewing? I am I am sure. It's time for Questions Brewing. <laughs> there are some new names, to too. You by Lost Lost Farmer Brewing. I have a feeling that uh, there's some very colorful comments in that chat tonight. So, Ed, yeah. Sorry, how are you guys did, doing? Did, did, I I talk, mean, did I talk over the narration? Do you need to replay that? I feel bad. No, you know, so. sometimes I just go with the feel of, like, <laughs> leading it into it. I like when it builds up. It's time for Questions 
and then the song hits. Brought to you drop. by yeah. Lost Farmer. Yeah. Brewing. Yeah. I want to get I want Lost Farmer to make sure we got the logos on screen. Okay, okay. Yeah, we're you guys got go. the you guys got the beverages, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. You know, crack one open now. Why not? Yeah, yeah. why not? Six after the show. Oh yeah, that there sounded we go. good. Yeah, what do you got? All right. Well, uh, we're gonna start off with Enzeb, who has a lot of questions actually brewing tonight. All right, he's he's, he's keeping it. Uh, just on the straight and narrow tonight with the questions. Okay. To the, just to the get The frustrations. I mean, you you started a fire by, the, uh, by saying let it all out. Well, good. They're good. Uh, but also the other thing, I just to get out ahead of it, and of course I'll wind up answering some of them, but <laughs> like I don't think this is the time to, now they're going to fire Lou. What's going to happen with the coach oh, yeah, if they don't happening. make it? <laughs> like I think course. that's for you and Stefan next week. <laughs> Yeah, let's let's wait until the season's yeah. actually over before Why be we get on the there? record well, saying something and then hey, we're back to the playoff preview. <laughs> well, speaking of saying something, you know what? I have a question's brewing to start this off for you, Chris. Okay. Bo Horvat and his comment the other night yeah. after their big win against Philadelphia. Is that why they lost tonight? <laughs> <laughs> Did that jinx them for tonight? I think it's a shame that he oh, had the Vancouver that, thing. That, that, yeah, I think yeah. it's a shame yeah. that it kind of became a little bit of a distraction. Yeah. I think it, it's clear that Bo Horvat. I don't know diddly about Bo, but uh-huh, but <laughs> nice. I um, but nice. it seems like he's a quality guy. Mm. And as much as we loved what he said because it was complimentary to us fellow Islander fans, right? There's no question that by the time he got home, he heard from so many people, probably including family, who said, hey, buddy, good line, but now, you know, we're hearing about this and we don't need this. It's it's the equivalent of saying something on Twitter that you wish you could take back. I don't mean like a horrible, horrible yeah. thing. Because, and so it became a thing. Not why they lost. I know you're, you're kidding. Um, I think it's a shame that he, he you know, he had to <laughs> right. talk about it today or and yeah. he proactively did. Mm-hmm. Um, I think... I, he strikes me as a guy who has a good heart and in the moment thought he was saying something fun for the fans for the fans yep. there. Mm-hmm. Yep. Uh, and let's face it, when you're being interviewed in that spot, that post game and it's played over the PA and I see this with the Yankees when they do this too, a mm-hmm. lot of times, right? So that was on the PA, mm-hmm. right? Yep. You, you think it might you're just, just be talking the to the fans. Yeah, right. You're not thinking, and of course, everything's seen. Now. But that would have made it out anyway. Yeah, it would have made and, it out. Uh, anyway. But but it, there's a there's a uh, the wall comes down a little bit, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, you, yeah. You sit yeah. there, and by that third question, okay, now here's the one where Aaron Judge is going to go out of his way to say comp- something complimentary about the fans in mm-hmm. the Bronx, right? Mm-hmm. Or uh, 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 the Mets, right? So I think that's all that was, and then it. It became something. I so, think and he, most players would have just moved on, and you know. But he was a heel, but he's not a heel <laughs> in real life. And he came out and he said what he did today. Look, I, I I appreciate all of it. I'm not in the guy's head, but I think he just meant that he was happy to be in a playoff race compared to Vancouver not being in a playoff yeah. race. I kind of think that's where he was going with it. Now, yeah. Whether he was or not. It just I don't in, know. In the moment it came out yeah. worse, and uh, and it, it surely became did. A thing. I mean, when I I think <laughs> as of this morning, it had well over a million views. And, oh wow! And you know, our beloved Islanders, a clip. You know, you, you know, when Lane talks, that those clips get five thousand views, right? You know, mm-hmm. that that thing got a, a million views. All right, Ed. Well, what do you got? Great exposure for Dan and Hogan. Yeah. <laughs> yes, indeed. Um, well, this is in regards to the beginning of the show. Um, <laughs> And Zeb was saying, you say there's a there wasn't a lack of effort, but doesn't mental mistakes and lack of execution play mm. into that? Okay. Okay. I mean we'll bring in a sports psychologist <laughs> to answer that one. Yeah, listen. Of course. I th- yeah, there, there's there's it's I g- urgent you know, it's the whole urgency thing. It's all like what does that mean, right? Or but also they, be they, they, mentally prepared yeah, to play, they, not just physically prepared they, they to play. They got into a position where in their biggest game of this year. They were losing three nothing. Like yeah. sometimes it's not even. Deserving but like the, of any the more third analysis. goal was was just comedy. I mean that was uh, you know kind of like a, a comedy skit. And the, you know Pollock drops a stick, then Pellick steps on it. I mean you can be as ready for a game as you want. I mean that's just something that that happened and and it just went absolutely south. That's that's a play you laugh off in in the middle of the season. You know and and it is what it is, right? But because it happened in a game so damn critical, it just it's so glaring and it looks so damn ridiculous. But um, but no, they, there's something of that. I mean, yeah, they they should have been ready to not allow two goals in the first minute and three seconds of the game. I'll give you that. That's fair. Yeah. Uh, and Remy thirteen, 
asks, what do you think Malkin does if this team misses the playoffs, which now seems more likely? Well, that's that that's that question I think we're gonna we're gonna table for uh for when when we actually know whether they, they make the playoffs. Yeah, there'll or be not. plenty of time to talk about that. Yeah. Um do I think that you know, the question so I'll, I'll just address it this way. The question, mm-hmm. you know, implies that there could be some sort of strong reaction to not making mm-hmm. it. And I just don't know if that's there. I've had a lot of people uh, come up to me or, or, or friendly conversations too, people in the business and, and friends and fans with a lot of different theories. If mm-hmm. they made the playoffs, Lou would be ready to hand it all. You know, like, and I just, um, you know, it's going to come down to a conversation between Lou and Malkin of whether he stays in one year, where there's a little bit of a transition. You know, that's, but whether that's going to happen in a few weeks or a few months from now, I just don't have a feel for that right now. Yeah, and I think, you know, what they'll end up asking themselves if they don't make the playoffs is, will, will the Islanders going forward be the team that, you know, went, you know, what was it, 10, 10 games over five hundred over the last 30 games or whatever it was? Is that the team that's going to start the season next year? Or are they, are they a little more concerned it's going to be the inconsistent team? But uh, we'll obviously dive, you know, more in depth to that stuff if and when there's a postmortem on the season. What's, uh, let me say one more thing about this. <laughs> what, what, what's, what's incredibly unique about our Islanders and going back to the time that I worked as well and continuing to today is the answer to that question is, is that it's not, there's nothing traditional or normal about this. Let me explain. Mike Milbury dear friend of mine, year after year was retained despite, you know, everybody from Mad Dog Russo to every fan, you know, saying, how do you have your job against all odds? Mm-hmm. And that's because he had a good relationship with Charles Wong. Charles mm-hmm. Wong loved him. Same exact thing for Garth Snow. That, right. that Gar- you know, I mean, Charles passed away. Right, I mean, yeah. it's Garth was GM year after year. But these guys aren't year. hired to be the owner's friend. Co- that's correct. Now this is different. This isn't a Garth and Mike thing mm-hmm. with Charles. But what is different about it, he's now the third GM in this category. Let's throw out Neil Smith's uh, forty days and nights. Is that this is Lou Lamorello we're talking about? Now I don't believe, uh, and I will never believe that Lou Lamorello deserves any kind of special consideration he deserves courtesy class integrity professionalism that Mm -hmm. i would like all employees to have right Mm -hmm. but he is an employee um so but do i think he uh, has earned or warrants some sort of special position where he gets a lot of say and gets to call his shot and perhaps hand it off to his son uh no i don't do I think that is what is going on and will go on? I do. Hmm. So, the, so the question: If you were to go on, any, if you were to go on just about any other show, right, where the GM of the Blue Jackets or pick a team, right, has a few years of failure in a row, and it's a bad mistake, the question would be pretty obvious. It's like Peter Peter Laviolette is not going to be the coach of the Capitals probably after this week. His contract's run out. And yeah. it's just like, hey, yeah. didn't get the job done. We know there was extenuating circumstances. The mm-hmm. team got old. You gave it a shot. We love you. You got your three years and you got a few mil and maybe you'll <laughs> do this again. But, okay. None of the, those normal things that happen with most sports teams mm-hmm. are not what is happening again here with the Islanders. Okay. Fair enough. Ed, what else you got? A lot of people concerned about the future of Ilya Sorokin and Mr. Tom Boyle is no exception. Tom Boyle, what's up? He asks... Do you see Sorokin leaving this summer if the Islanders don't qualify for the playoffs? I know I would. Wow. Well, he doesn't get to. He has a yeah, he has one on more year. Yeah. So, he, yeah. What's fascinating about Sorokin is that his number by all rights, and I know this is a weird night to be saying it because he wasn't great, uh, should almost certainly start with a 10. Should year, right. be the, being the operative it, word if he if he's going to give any kind of a discount and his owner I do, uh, his agent I know does have a very good relationship with Lou Lamorello and mm-hmm. his team you know maybe it's a nine so then you're looking at three guys mm-hmm. making uh, twenty seven or so give or take million dollars a year right so that 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 is going to become a, an issue sure uh, but as for him leaving this year no. Um, do I think he'll be an Islander for, for years beyond this? Yes. Yeah, I, I think Ilya will, will stick around. But um, I, I understand the question. Ed. Yes. 
All right, so when does Lambert get the blame for this catastrophe of a team? Lou, Lou needs to blame. Lou needs the blame as well as players, but can't change all the players. Yeah, well, you can't. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah can't. Who asked that question? That was Enzab09. Enzab09. If they don't make the playoffs, and we don't know yet, if they don't make the playoffs, um, that'll be a, a very fair question, and people will wonder. And it would be very un like if he stays as president and general manager to retain this coach after not making the playoffs. He is fired coaches for far less. Mm, <laughs> uh, this is not, true. Including here. So... Um, you know, that, that'll that'll be a, a question. By the way, I think it would still be a question if the Islanders make the playoffs and lose in five or six in the first round. Uh, mm. Lane Lambert. And I think Lane Lambert knows that. Mm. Um, so, you? Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I, I My gut tells me that he's still going to be coaching the team next year no matter what happens. Whether that's the right decision or not, you know, that's up for debate. But I, I just think he's probably going to stick around. Like, it's funny because... I guess if they didn't end up being as successful as they were with Matt Barzell being out, and maybe maybe that was kind of like a built-in excuse for for why the the season you mm-hmm. know went into a tailspin, right? But they ended up playing great after he went down, and, and we talked about it, you know, on this show. It, it might have even been a necessary evil for this team to kind of start improving their play, right? Because they kind of shifted into a more defensive style, a more conservative style, because they didn't have him on the ice. So it's it's interesting to think about, but but listen, at the end of the day. Um, would I be shocked if, if Lou went in another direction? No, because as you said, he, he tends to, you know, make some decisions like that when, you know, he sees basically no, uh, no light at the end of the tunnel. But, um, yeah, it's just a gut, gut feeling for me that I think that Lambert, uh, is going to be the coach of this team, regardless if they miss the playoffs and, and how far they, they get it or not. Save the clip. What do you got? All right. And Zeb with the hard hitting questions again. Uh, why play the fourth line so much when we are down 2-0 and then 3-0? We needed goals. Eh. Which to me sounds like a I mean, that's fire, usually the, fire Lane Lambert. Yeah, I mean, that's usually <laughs> the line that gets them going, right? I don't have a problem with that. It's, right. I mean, you, you, you asked Andy about, you know, did they need a fight or something like that? Did they need a spark? If you're looking for a spark, that's the line you're putting out there for a spark, right? So a little bit of that maybe. And, and look, when that line is on their game, you know, they – they have a tendency to create something. I mean, maybe not even, maybe not necessarily a goal, but just maybe start to generate some momentum, some chances down low, and and when they do shift off the ice, the next guys come on, then then maybe they're the ones putting the puck in the net. But but yeah, look, I mean, you had you had your guys, you had Engvall hitting at least one post, you had Pajot, I think, hitting at least one post. So you had some of the guys who were a little more expected to score. They couldn't put it in. Um, you know, I don't think I'm going to ever look back at this game and say the reason why they lost is because they played the fourth line too much, but you know, Fair. yeah. Uh, and Zeb again, you know, uh, <laughs> is there anybody else? I was saying, didn't yeah, other I mean, people have, well, so no, don't, <laughs> dude, what else? No disrespect else we, to Enzeb, yeah, but we want to I mean, include well, other people. I, we, we got some others in there. Then we, we only got a couple of minutes left, so read well, through a couple of well, other I'm people. I'm saying, I did, I did, uh, ask other people's questions, however, Enzeb, uh, has all the rest of the questions brewing here, it seems, oh, well, and everything yeah. else all right. is... Uh, all right. Let's take one more. And questions brewing brought to you by Enzeb. What do you got? Yeah, I mean, he's taken over. I mean, everyone else... I mean, everyone's having, you know, conversations tonight, right, but right. Enzeb is okay. asking the hard-hitting questions, right. and for that, I, I got I to gotta commend them. Okay. Uh, what makes you think the Isles will take care of business against the Habs? Couldn't beat the depleted Caps. Yeah, no, I, it's a, I think that's a very fair question. I have no idea... Um, yeah, I already said it earlier. I that's no lock. Um, if if it was a if the if the game didn't mean anything, it would be one of those happy horse shit season for home season finales. Right. That I saw way too many of where everybody got their milestone goal and it got tied up into a bow, right. and this guy got his thirtieth and this guy got his seventieth point, and everybody went home happy and Josh Bailey got a goal and you know everything was great. Uh, but no, that's <laughs> not what this is. This game is going to you're going to spit out your beer. This uh, this this game is going to mean something. So it probably won't play out that way. The key will be that first period and that start. I don't expect they're going to come out stale. Uh, the question will be, do they execute? Are they uh, overhyped? Uh, I, I don't think it, it won't be a thing where they come out flat. The, the fans won't let them. By the way, the fans were fantastic the other night mm. in the home game. Uh, 
things is loud. Mm. Man, it, it, it's it's awesome. I mean, I it's not how it always was. And this generation of Islander fans around this group, mm-hmm. uh, and that would be one of the many shames if this was to end this week, uh, would it would be like would feel like a little bit of an of an error passing. I think the Islanders are going to crush the Canadians on Wednesday. Okay, I th- they're de- I definitely think they're going to win, but I just have a feeling it's going to be by multiple goals. Like I don't think I don't think we're going to be sweating about the result of that game. Okay. We're going to be sweating about the results of Thursday's game. And we're going to basically be waiting to see if, oh, they won and it's a shame <laughs> things didn't mm-hmm. go their way. Or they won and they got a little help from the hockey gods. That's how I see this playing out. I think they win on Wednesday. Uh, look, because if they don't, then they deserve the fate that they get. I mean, to, to stumble today and then to stumble again against Montreal, like book your tea times, that's what you deserve, right? So I think they're going to come out. They're going to they're gonna give a good effort on Wednesday. They're going to beat the Canadians. And we have to hope that either Pittsburgh completely craps the bed against two of the worst teams in the league or hope that the Carolina Hurricanes show up and take care of the Florida Panthers. And that's ultimately what it's going to come down to. In, yeah. in oh, last quick uh, questions, Bruin. This just in. Okay. Uh, Who is in the lineup Wednesday? A, Bailey. B, Barzal. C, none. D, both. Huh. Interesting. Do you think they try to do a little hero's entrance with Matt Barzal with the, with the season on the, on the line here? I thought of that during the game today, and it feels like maybe it's a little late. I, yeah, I, I guess it may mean nothing. The only thing I would say to this and to that, and I have, you know, pure trust in Lou Lane, mm-hmm. Sean Donellan, the doctors, everybody else. Mm-hmm. They, you would you would not bring that guy in unless you were really sure. Yeah, uh, he was not risking anything. So, um, because it's a game they should win without him. And all the other things that they need to happen, Matt Barzell can't do a damn thing about, right? (laughs) Pittsburgh. Right. uh, Florida. Right. Other thing I'll say is, like, let us remember that after everybody held serve on Saturday, we then went to today, and neither team got the job done. Florida got a point and right, you know, and right, you know, the fans were all happy and it was okay. <laughs> but they, but then Tavares scored. So they, so in this, what in irony the, that would be in this new week of things where these games are, these teams are under a lot of pressure. Uh, neither team was successful. The Islanders failed spectacularly. I get it, but neither team was successful. We now go on to tomorrow and then Wednesday. And then games on Thursday. So, you know, we can't assume that the other teams are somehow not going to have their moments like the Islanders did today. And just you only need you only need one of them to do it once, basically. Right. Right. And Ed, what was it? Was it uh, Bailey Barzell? Was there a third player in that question? Uh, it was C, none. D, both. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So. You know what? You know, I got a chance to think about that while while Chris was chatting. You know, I, I kind of wouldn't be surprised if they went back to Bailey. I kind of wouldn't be surprised if they pulled Holmes from out for him. I'm not saying it's the right decision, but, you know, maybe Lambert's like, you know what, I'll go with the veteran for this last game because maybe, maybe he ends up being the hero that night. You know what I mean? I thought it was a little early for folks to talk about Horvat and Holmes from getting their act together because they got a couple of goals Laid against mm. crappy teams. That's all. That's a different subject, but it reminded me of it. Okay, so I'm I saying wanna see, you want to see more, right? Yeah, and uh, yeah. So maybe Bailey, <laughs> maybe <Shmabie> not, <laughs> right? And that's uh, that's it. I, I guess that's it. Ed. Any yeah, any? Bill any says other? sounds like Chris Botta says uh, he's going with C for none. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know. It's probably C. I just I I, I don't think we're going to see Barzell. I don't think he's going to. He be hasn't ready. practiced with the team. So yeah, I don't he, think we're going to see If he Barcelona. plays on Wednesday, even after one practice, say Tuesday, that would be a rush, and this is not a place where you want to rush that kind of magnificent athlete yeah. because they don't need him to beat Montreal. They shouldn't need him to beat Correct. Montreal. Correct. Save him for if and when they get into the playoffs. Yeah. That's that's how I look at that. Right. I think it's a great reveal if it were a WWE storyline for him to come out. <laughs> And uh, kind of like be like, oh my god, it's bon yeah. God. I don't, I don't, I don't yeah, think that dream's not, gonna come true. Not in this situation. Sorry, <laughs> sorry, bud. Well, thanks. what a night. What a thanks night. to everybody in the chat, and uh, yeah. thanks for everybody for getting their questions, and especially Enzeb. Love, love the enthusiasm. Love the uh, the multiple questions. But with that, 
We are going to roll on out of here. So, want to send a huge thanks to Andy Sutton and Stefan Rosner for joining us tonight. Great spots from them. Also, a huge thanks to our wonderful sponsors, starting with Blue Line Deli and Bagels, located at 719 West Jericho Turnpike in Huntington. That is their flagship location. Check them out at bluelinedeli.com. Also, a big thanks to Lost Farmer Brewing Company, located at 63A 2nd Street in Miola. Check them out at lostfarmerbrewing.com. And, of course, a big thanks to Main Street Board Game Cat. Cafe located at 307 Main Street in Huntington Village. Check those fine folks out at mainstboardgamecafe.com. Also, a big thanks to you guys for tuning in at twitch.tv slash hockey night and why and your favorite podcast providers. Regardless of what happens Wednesday, there will be a show next week. We will be talking about hopefully a miracle or perhaps a little post mortem on the island of season. Either way, please tune in next week. You can follow Chris Botta on Twitter at Chris Botta NHL. You can follow myself at Shawnee Hockey. You can follow Stefan Rosner at Stefan underscore Rosner. You can follow the show at Hockey Night NY on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok. And again, folks, if you enjoy what we're doing here at Hockey Night New York, please spread the word. Tell your friends. Let everybody know what we got going on here at Florida Media in Rockville Center. So for Chris Botta, for Ed and Jay, my name is Sean Cuthbert. We've been Hockey Night New York. Have a great rest your night.